So I welcome you back for today's session. So as Shri Priya had mentioned, today our topic is on psychosocial concerns and we have Ms. Mukta Dawalikar. So I take pleasure in inviting you for this session, ma'am. Uh, she is an RCI registered clinical psychologist, completed MPhil in clinical psychology from Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. Uh, she is also working as a consultant clinical psychologist at the Lhasa Center for Palliative Care for the past three years. We welcome you for today's session and over to you, Ms. Mukta. Thank you. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Uh, thank you for inviting me again for this new batch as well. I hope I'm audible. Uh, just excuse me if my volume is low or just let me know in the chat box because I have a slight cold. Okay, uh, so let us start. First of all, a big thank you to, to all of you uh, who are here today uh, for wanting to step into this field and taking up this training uh, because this is a field which is very, very close uh, to my heart. And uh, I understand that you're all doctors who are new to the palliative care setting, uh, but uh, considering that you've had all these number of sessions uh, until now, you would have some sort of an idea about what palliative care is. Uh, so can we start from there? Can we start from what you know about uh, palliative care? You could either unmute and let me know, or you could type it out in the chat box. Uh, again, this is not an exam. I'm not judging you, <laughs> giving you marks here. Uh, we also need, it need not be a definition also. It can just be about what you know, what is your understanding about what palliative care is. It's okay to give very, very imperfect answers. So can anybody tell me what their idea is? Anyone? You can comment in the chat box too. Uh, Dr. Madhumukta, do you mean pa it's, uh, palliative care is care to a terminally ill patient? Is that what you were saying? T okay. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else wants to add anything to that? It's a special branch of what do you say, or medicine, which aims at alleviating the troubles and whatever are the symptom relief, plus mm -hmm. improving the quality of life. Hmm. It may be in a terminally ill patient or in a patient who has got life-limiting illnesses. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So... Uh, if we had to if we had to look at a definition per se uh, could you could you change the slide yeah uh, the next one okay yeah so if we had to look at a definition palliative care is treatment aimed at improving uh, quality of life of patients as uh, you rightly mentioned ma'am and then uh, of patients and their families who are facing problems associated with life-limiting illnesses. It prevents and relieves suffering through early identification, correct assessment, and treatment of pain and other problems. When I say other problems, they might be physical, psychosocial, or spiritual. That is what WHO tells us, right? So now let's move away from this definition a little bit, okay? Instead of theoretically understanding this concept, Let's look at what we all do on a day-to-day -day basis. All of you working as medical professionals, you would have witnessed people suffering, right? If you had to just get out of uh, your cabin and just look at your OPD, what is it that you would see? The first thing that you would notice about people who are waiting in your OPD, what would that be? <laughs> Does anybody want to share what they, what they can observe? in their patients? The first thing that you see when you look at your patients. Hmm. 
they were worried yes anything else depression okay hopelessness scared absolutely in pain yes and when you say in pain ma'am is it just physical pain you look around and what you see is that they are unhappy right they look emotionally distressed some of them might be crying some of them look scared some are restless they're pacing up and down so we realize that the patient is not only in physical pain and distress but there is also a component of psychological social spiritual distress along with that and the quality of life is really really hampered uh, next slide please okay yeah <clears throat> so they are basically unable to do things that they once did so efficiently things which added value to their life like earning for themselves earning for their loved ones feeling good in mind and body being able to do things that they love simple things like going out spending time with friends enjoying eating good food so much that added quality to their life is either lost or is reduced and palliative care is all about looking into these aspects along with pain and symptom management right so we talk about holistic whole person care we talk about psychological well being spiritual well being emotional well being and social well being and apart from the fact that illness affects well being in all these areas we should also not forget that the mind body connection is ultimately a two way connection okay so just the way body affects the mind the mind also affects the body right emotional distress is very often uh, seen to exacerbate people's perceptions of pain so psychological social and spiritual well being will have an impact on physical well being as well so if sometimes you might even see that how it impacts the disease trajectory so we have had patients who were seen that you know in spite of pain management in spite of whatever was done with the medication we did not see any change there was no reduction in pain uh even with increased dosages and then when probed out came bucket full of psychosocial issues stumbling out and and then we realized that oh this was what was mediating the pain perception so basically what i am trying to put across is that mind body connection is a two way connection and that both of them affect each other right okay moving on <clears throat> who is this for again caring is not only limited to the patient right we say that we are caring for the caregivers also the entire family why is that why is family the unit of care one thing is your patient symptoms and how how the patient's family is coping with the illness are not two unrelated things both need to be addressed because that is healthier for both and because they affect each other so let's say for example a life threatening diagnosis something like uh, okay uh, consider a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is traumatic for a 37 year old woman yes agreed is it also equally traumatic for her 40 year old husband or her 10 year old child or her aging mother right so the emotional and physical resources of the entire family are threatened right from money to savings to resilience to their ability to deal with stress it's a family crisis it's not an individual crisis the patient is not isolated they are part of a family system so the patient psychosocial physical health is going to impact the family and vice versa you might have seen patients with terminal illnesses who have spouses suffering from depression or from some other psychosomatic symptoms where their health also deteriorates because losses that are suffered by the patient are also losses suffered by the family for example a patient's loss of role as the head of the family is also going to be the family's loss of a primary breadwinner and in addition to all of this there is exhaustion there is stress which comes with caregiver duties which can lead to burnout and compassion fatigue and the guilt that is associated with that all of this in addition due to inadequate understanding about what palliative care is 
even a referral to a palliative care service is experienced as a crisis. So yes, the family also needs to be supported in this entire journey. So family-centered care, where the healthcare team, the patient, and their families have an equal partnership is the basis of the work that we do. Uh, now, uh, Shubhra, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So you might all agree with me on this, that it's not only a physical illness, there are other psychosocial issues, and that it's the entire family which is facing these issues, right? But some of you might have a question about why you need to know about it. You're not a psychologist or a social worker or a psychiatrist, so what will you do? You need to know about this so that you can do the needful. Because it's a multidisciplinary team, we all need to be aware of the possible issues that can arise in our patients so that we identify, assess, we do our bit to support, and if needed, we can refer to a specialist. There is a psychosocial dimension to the work of all the professionals involved in palliative care, and understanding this will definitely strengthen the practice of any professional who is working in this field. Even if you cannot actively do anything to help relieve emotional suffering, you can always listen. And never, never underestimate the therapeutic value of listening empathetically to the story that your patient is bringing. You need not be able to hand over solutions to them, but just being able to give them a space that they are heard is also incredibly healing. When I say healing, some of you might uh, be wondering how are these patients going to heal? Uh, there is one thing I'd like to clarify. We are not talking about a cure. Cure is about getting rid of the illness, removing it. Healing, on the other hand, is an acceptance of change, looking at themselves in a different light, not as sufferers, and seeking personal resources to facilitate that change so that they're able to look inside and they're able to find the strength within to deal with this. That is what I mean by healing. And you all can promote it in a big way, even by just allowing them, giving them the space to vent it all out. So let's first look at what psychosocial spiritual issues can arise in this context so that you'll be able to identify them in your patients. Along with that, let's also look at what can be done to assess the extent of distress and to treat it. Now, it's not really possible to separate out these issues into psychological and social and spiritual. We can only do it up to an extent because these are pretty much overlapping issues. So when we're discussing one particular issue, it will have psychological aspects, social aspects, and also spiritual aspects in varying degrees, right? So the first thing that we're going to talk about, uh, Tripriya, next slide. Uh, next one. Next one. <laughs> Okay, yes. So the first thing we want to talk about is communication. One of the first issues that comes up. Uh, communication issues and breaking the bad news. I won't go into the details of it because you either would have already had a session, separate session on communication, or if not, you would be having it in the coming sessions. So instead of getting into the protocol of how to break bad news, etc., I would like to draw your attention to what happens when there is miscommunication or a lack of communication about the illness and in the family. Uh, if we are not, if a patient is coming to us, a family is coming to us and we are uh, hurriedly doing the further procedures, we are not really communicating to them what to expect. It can cause further problems. You might have also witnessed such patients and families where you see arguing, non-compliance with treatment, because people have misconceptions about the diagnosis and treatment. So supporting and educating the family is really vital here. It's important that they have an adequate understanding of the illness and the expected process. We should give enough time to address everyone's concerns about it and to help them communicate clearly. Speaking of communication issues within the family, even the most functional families find it difficult to talk openly about this. Naturally, they tend to hide feelings, etc., to protect family members from feeling hurt. So they might either hide their distress from each other or hide the news in the first place, especially from children. Before I began practicing during my training, a major part of my work was with pediatric cancer patients. And I've seen innumerable such parents who would, uh, you know, constantly hide their own pain and sadness and fear from their child. 
and they did it to stay strong for their child you know but the problem is children sense hidden restlessness and anxiety they know that their parents are hiding something from them and that is even more unsettling and scary ki what is it that they are hiding why are they not telling me so usually there is no choice about whether or not to tell them because one they read emotions around them they notice adults talking in hushed voices quickly wiping tears and secondly they respond to body language they can see sympathy in people's eyes and thirdly they are aware of changes in their routine they realize that mama had gone to hospital and she hasn't come back yet that my papa doesn't drop me to school anymore that my auntie packs my tiffin now they notice all these things so honest open communication in a way that children understand is the key in this case and we need to help parents see uh, see this if they're misguided in their attempts to protect their children from harm and that is why they are hiding things so one of our major role is in facilitating open communication and expression between members and between families and treating teens the second issue that we come across is predominantly social in nature and that is loss <clears throat> okay uh can i move to the next slide yes so uh loss is again not necessarily only loss of life losses experienced by patients in relation to their social world uh are also very very important concerned with their engagement with the world outside home with their roles and relationships in the family uh, it could be a loss of future it could be a loss of identity it could be a loss of social engagements of self esteem associated with their identity for example a uh, loss of my role as a teacher is definitely associated with so many other things a loss of financial independence a loss of a meaningful contribution to society a loss of living according to my values of my confidence in my role so much of our self concept is linked to who we are and what we do in a social context without that we might not even know who we are so as mobility and energy is declined it becomes harder to participate in social events and to maintain friendships that were built on shared activities and interests social isolation is a frequent source of pain for both the patient and the carer and in some cases it is possible to an extent to get them to meet friends or colleagues to have meaningful interactions with them but for some others uh, the change in the way they feel about themselves and their declining functioning creates such a big huge gap between their past social engagement and their present limitations and conditions for them it is really not possible to participate in the earlier social groups or to connect with them in the same way so here the solution may be to participate in new social groups all together instead of trying to integrate back into the old groups it could be something like a cancer support group where you know they can both learn how others deal with a changed identity they can compare their own situation and they can continue to feel that they are making a contribution a valuable contribution especially with patients who say that they have stopped talking to people because they hate the look of sympathy in their eyes or pity people hesitate in sharing good news that they don't talk about anything else but my treatment etc etc so such kinds of experiences can lead to a feeling of being left out or being unable to connect with those who are unaffected by this uh, suffering that they are going through and those who are going uh, about with their previous routine this can also lead the person to withdraw further and it can cause them more pain carers also will have a changed identity they might be struggling to sustain other commitments to a job or to other needy family members they might have put their life on hold because they put the needs of the dying person first and man is a social animal ultimately we all need social connection so you might have witnessed caregivers helping each other in hospitals striking up friendships in wards they do so naturally because of their need to connect and because they feel understood a sense of connection they do this so support groups can really help when it comes to social pain when it comes to loss of social identity and social engagement right <clears throat> moving on to the next slide unfinished business okay uh, does anybody have an idea of what this could be what would unfinished business mean in this context
Can I answer? Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, unfinished business means uh, if there is a life limiting illness and uh, the person is uh, uh, aware that he has got uh, life limiting illness, now he is uh, he can die and he has very less number of time. Uh, hmm. So he, whatever he has to uh, finish like bank uh, statements, bank accounts, his hmm. property, he wish uh, he can give to his uh, uh, whoever is near to him. Uh, yeah. Those are all uh, unfinished business. If he wants to go to one privilege place, he can go visit and come. Then he right. can tell whether he wants to get uh, buried or uh, he wants to get it according to the Hindi rituals. And after hmm. that, where his ashes are supposed to be uh, uh, gone, all that he can hmm. tell to his dear ones. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I can also see a lot of uh, responses in the chat as well. All absolutely correct responses, of course. So you all have an idea of what unfinished business means. And uh, we've also, you might have seen already in your patients that unfinished business can lead to considerable distress. And this can manifest in many different ways. Uh, some of them might be restless, some might be anxious, there might be discomfort, guilt, helplessness. Uh, it could be about dreams and ambitions, about plans for life, like building their own house, taking care of financial commitments, like some of you have said. How to identify this? How to identify if there is unfinished business? You just have to keep your ears open and notice. If you hear for patients regrets, you would most likely get to know about that unfinished business. <coughs> Sorry. For example, I wish I had not stopped talking to my sister. Now looking back, it seems like such a trivial matter when faced with the possibility that I'll never be able to talk to her again. If your patient is saying this, what does this tell you? That reconciliation, maybe asking for forgiveness, is an unfinished business. And being able to complete that would bring some peace to this patient, right? Mostly unfinished business would be a major concern in younger patients in their prime who have children who are small and still studying and not settled on their own or who have parents who are aging. Here, the unfinished business would be revolving around their responsibilities as a parent towards their children and as grown up children towards their parents. In this context, the most common emotional distress would come from the feelings of guilt of not being here for them and anxieties about how they'll cope on their own when the patient is gone. Let me, uh, let me give you an example here of a very strong patient whom we lost. Uh, I think this example will help illustrate all the three points that we have discussed so far part, communication, loss, and unfinished business, it will also help you see what I mean when I say that these factors are overlapping. They're not really independent of each other. So this, this patient, she was a lady in her 30s, diagnosed with an illness only to know that it was in the terminal stage. There was no curative treatment available at this point. It was a sudden shocking news to her because she had been absolutely fine until then. There was no distress, no discomfort whatsoever. <laughs> and she had just gone for a routine normal medical checkup, which is when she found out about this. Suddenly, she was faced with loss of identity as a young professional, right? She had to stop going to work as her treatment uh, was uh, underway. As days passed, she quickly deteriorated became dependent on others for her basic needs. She could not bathe herself, needed help to walk to the toilet. There was loss of dignity, which was especially painful for her to bear at such a young age, uh, when no one is really prepared mentally for something like this. There was a loss of role. She had two young children, one barely a toddler who couldn't even walk yet. She couldn't fulfill her role as a mother. Her family was extremely supportive in all of this. They reassured her that they would take care of her children. So there was no anxiety regarding that per se, but there was the pain of leaving them behind, not being there to see them growing up. It was something she was leaving unfinished. There wasn't much that could be done to help her complete the task, so to say, right? <laughs> Unlike other unfinished tasks like reconciliation, which we saw in the previous example. But what the patient did here was, 
she asked her child to be brought to the hospital okay her elder child extremely attached to her a 12 year old girl and uh, what she did was once the girl came she sat with her and she told her how ill she was she explained to her what a terminal illness means what stage her illness was at in a way that the child would understand and she cried with her child and told her that she loved her and that she'll always love her as a palliative care professional when she told me this my first thought was that it was such a beautiful difficult and brave thing to do but sadly enough that was not how her family felt about this when she was telling her daughter this her family had tried to stop her constantly saying that she shouldn't be saying things like this and questioning her why she was putting her child through this etc etc and that really disturbed her so she had come to me with a question of whether she was being a bad parent by doing this but somewhere she knew the answer to herself she told me and i'm quoting this word back to i know they didn't want me to say it but it's the truth i very strongly needed to say it and the reason why she decided to tell was one she didn't wanted to come as a shock for her child that suddenly one day her mother was not there and secondly she said if i hadn't told then i don't know if i would have gotten the chance to tell her that i loved her that i wasn't abandoning her here comes the issue of communication the family trying to protect the child didn't want her to know that her mother was going to go but <coughs> as research with children of deceased parents shows us it is best for the child to be involved in and given a choice to say goodbye the ideal steps for us to follow would have been to find out from the child what she already knew picking up from cues from the atmosphere <coughs> to help her mother communicate with her if necessary reassuring the mother that this was good parenting to give her child knowledge of what was happening and helping her identify sources of support for the child and this patient intuitively did all of that her only request had to us had been to help her child through the process of understanding the loss and supporting the child through the grieving process in doing what she did telling the child and making the request to us she did indeed take care of her unfinished business to the best of her ability and when we validated her decision to communicate with her child and assured that we would talk to her she could give us a genuine smile and that was the last i saw of her many a times families are not ready to have this conversation they would rather protect the child but what they don't realize is by keeping them ignorant we are doing just the opposite of protecting them we are making them weaker we are not opening up doors for them to ask their doubts to prepare themselves for what is to come and to ensure that they don't blame themselves which children often do <coughs> moving on so far we saw communication we saw loss and we saw unfinished business now next comes a very very practical issue shukriya next slide please okay next a very practical issue financial problems as we look into a comprehensive psychosocial assessment we also inquire about financial concerns many a times as people undergo long treatments over years without any money coming in drains up much of their savings some might be from a poor financial background to begin with so financial issues is a very very real concern why are we addressing it under psychosocial issues because it is a source of distress for many <coughs> it can even stop them from help seeking there might be fear and anxiety about it which again means that they might not respond very well to our treatment if these underlying causes of anxiety are left unaddressed so talk about it for some who have been well off until then receiving charity so to say or asking for help can be extremely difficult because it can lead to a loss of self esteem what is our role in all of this <coughs> one is to talk it out with them listen to their perceptions how do they feel about taking financial help and is there something that stops them and secondly to get them in touch with agencies that can provide aid if you have a social worker at uh, your setup they can definitely do this for you 
Uh, for example, at the Lhasa, the place where I consult, uh, we have the Cancer Society Aid, which is available. So the decision makers are informed about this right at the time of admission so that they can avail it. Again, here it is important that all those involved in the treatment know about this. For example, uh, we had a patient who kept insisting immediately after admission to take him home. Very, very adamant about it. He had a young son who was working. The nurses inquired with him whether he was not happy with the care he received. Was his pain not being managed the way he expected? Basically, they were trying to find out what was the reason he so desperately wanted to leave. Then we realized that he was troubled thinking that this is a private hospital and it is going to cost a bomb and we can't afford it. And being a proud man, he felt ashamed to share this with the treating team. But he told his wife and she told her son. Now what the son did was, he just kept reassuring the father, you don't think about it, I'll manage it. You don't think about it, I'll take care of it. Which the patient felt was just a false reassurance. He needed to be involved in the process of financial decision making because he had been the breadwinner for the family for all this time. Once he was told about the aid and how it worked, he was much more relaxed and he was ready to continue with the treatment. So ensure that you involve the patient as much as possible in the decision making process, not just in terms of finances, but otherwise as well, because it maintains their sense of autonomy in their lives, <laughs> a sense of control which is what most of your patients are seeking when they come for palliative care. Next, we talk about spiritual issues. Some of these being social spiritual issues as well, with an overlap with what we discussed regarding loss of social role, etc., etc. <coughs> Research shows us that spiritual issues, spiritual sorry, spiritual well-being is one of the most important influences on quality of life at the end of life. Patients may experience a number of spiritual issues, including but not limited to lack of meaning, guilt, shame, hopelessness, loss of dignity, loneliness, anger towards God, feeling abandoned by God, feeling out of control, grief, and spiritual suffering. This is not only limited to religiosity and faith. It goes beyond that. <coughs> As one nears end of life or faces the reality of being mortal so closely, they might begin to have existential questions like what is the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? What did I achieve in this lifetime? With that, they might start to think about the past and question what did I even contribute? What am I leaving behind? It is important to help them reminisce to look at their past trumps. What have they achieved? It could be something very, very simple. It could be something like raising three good children, even through difficult circumstances, or being a valued employee of the company where they worked. Knowing what they did was valued is what keeps hopelessness at bay. Keeping hopelessness at bay is what keeps clinical depression at bay. <laughs> Reminiscing past terms, knowing what they did was valued is extremely important. It's a time when reviewing the past can put the present in context. It can give perspective. It can be very, very affirming to the dying person. And this can be done in several ways. For some people, informally talking with family and friends may uh, give them the opportunity to go over the past victories and tragedies and to receive confirmation from the family members that the patient's contribution to the family has been valued. For others, a more formal life review may be helpful in settling anxiety and uncertainty. Formal life review processes have been developed in many parts of the world. Uh, they are also available online. If you search for them, you would find uh, formal life review process questionnaires, which you can use in your setups. Uh, again, let me give you an example of one of our patients. Uh, we had a caregiver, <clears throat> a young person, uh, who had come uh, come down to meet uh, his grandmother. His grandmother was a patient uh, admitted with us and she was a constant complainer. She would, uh, she would keep complaining about her pain, which would just not reduce. And she would not allow us or herself to get distracted from it in any way. Right? She would just constantly focus on the pain and keep complaining about the pain. And we had started wondering whether this was not really physical pain and it was more to do with her uh, existential queries and uh, feeling like there was no purpose that she was living for, etc., etc. And now when the caregiver, uh, her grandson had come down to visit her, he was going to stay there for two to three days. 
and we had suggested that he start reminiscing and he did that he sat and he uh, he spoke with his grandmother reminisced about uh, her past her earlier days a younger self you know asking her about past incidences when she was young how did she meet her husband etc etc and surprisingly enough she didn't once complain of pain in those entire two days so basically knowing that being able to cast a light on all the good that has happened can put things into perspective there is a significant improvement in life satisfaction and reduction in stress after such reviews and this is proven with research so uh, as an associated with life review can be a wish to leave a legacy or uh, to be involved in planning for the future of loved ones yeah next slide please <clears throat> okay yeah so when i say leaving a legacy it can be anything some of them might want to have concrete gifts that they leave behind a poem they wrote a painting a saree a recipe book you know, a parent with young children who is dying may wish to leave a letter or an audio tape or a video tape for the children to keep and refer to as they grow you can help them make memory books with messages pictures other small souvenirs or something personal for all the things that they would miss like their child's 21st birthday or their marriage or graduation etc etc so and this can be i mean uh, it, you don't need to have uh, professionals to do this you can also if you have uh, volunteers if you have nursing students in your setups you can take their help to uh, do this with the patients basically creating any kind of material it concentrates on demonstrating the value of the child for their parent reminders of the times that they shared is likely to be greatly treasured i mean just just imagine just put yourselves in their shoes and just imagine somebody that you have a loved one that you lost if they would have left you a letter or if they would have left you something uh, something personally valuable how would you have felt so definitely it's a very very treasured thing to have such a gift or such a legacy that is given or passed on making a will is another way of ensuring that your wishes continue to carry weight after your death but uh, i mean at least in indian settings we see that many a times people are resistant to this uh, it is a sort of a denial basically that uh, making a will means that you accept that this is going to happen that you are going to go away someday uh but yes you can definitely <coughs> suggest that they do it or at least suggest the caregivers that this be done because it is important apart from this spirituality very simply put is uh, being connected to something greater than one's own self or a higher power right not necessarily god not limited to religion as i said so assessing a patient's spiritual beliefs assessing the importance of spirituality in their life exploring whether they belong to a spiritual community is something that we need to do in a palliative care setting uh, and never assume assess if spirituality is important for the person don't assume and once you have uh, assume uh, once you sorry once you have assessed asserted how important and helpful it is a simple question is often sufficient something like is your faith or spirituality helpful to you and how important would you say this is to you followed up with are there ways in which we can support you in your faith or can we help provide you with anything or any facilities to support you <coughs> these are things that we need to ask because again let me give you an example we had a patient at dilasa Uh, who had told us when we were taking the history and when we were asking about his life he had reported that he used to visit a local temple every day in the evening that was a part of the social fabric of his life as well because that is where he met most of his neighbors and friends when we inquired if he had noticed uh, when he was brought in that we had a small place of worship in the hospital he said yes i have seen it he was bedridden though <coughs> so we asked him if being able to go see that idol in the evening and sit and pray there for some time would help you in any way he said yes it was just a matter of arranging for a wheelchair to take him to the next room it had never occurred to him that he could ask for it and that the hospital staff would be willing to do something about it because according to him 
this was a hospital and the hospital staff was there to take care of his physical pain yeah it never occurred to him that this was something that we would be willing to do for him so interventions need not be complicated need not be about super brain science mostly they just need to be compassionate and human for them to work that is all that we need to do how does this help for those who believe in it concepts like transcendence soul liberation reincarnation etc can help the patients deal with dying and make meaning out of it it can also help reduce suffering and can facilitate acceptance of the situation this acts like a buffer against distress particularly hopelessness helplessness loneliness depression and death anxiety transcendence uh, can we go to the next slide yeah okay transcendence that is a belief in a higher power beyond human existence enables connectedness removes the isolation of suffering by setting it in a larger landscape uh, and if you go to see the religious traditions of the world have their own interpretations of suffering and many have practices that enable people to transcend their innate selves through prayer through meditation through various rituals whilst they acknowledge the reality of suffering they also point towards an ultimate goodness of the universe and fulfillment of the human soul beyond suffering even for the family rituals that follow death is how the family makes sense of their loss that is how they process their grief um, so these acts of remembrance that we have regardless of which culture you go to in overall uh, in across the world you will see these rituals because they aid in processing grief but very very important make sure you are not letting your own beliefs interfere that you are not pushing the patient in any way to either engage or not engage in spiritual practices it is our job to respect the patient's spiritual orientation or a lack of it and to encourage spiritual practice only if a person is already engaging in it or would like to engage in it but not to push those who do not <laughs> right just to ensure give them space and ensure that patients are given the opportunity to express their spiritual beliefs and practices that is uh, the limit of what we can do in our role as doctors uh moving on to the next uh, factor and that is grief and bereavement grief is as we know the emotional response associated with loss it's an inevitable dimension of our humanity uh, it's an adaptive adjustment process one that can be approached with courage if proper support is available so intervention is not always warranted for the majority of people although bereavement is painful their personal resilience will ensure that they normally adapt to this grief or sorry to this loss so therefore there is no justification for a routine intervention because normal grief is not pathological so we need not pathologize normal grief as the patient and family journey through palliative care the clinical phases of grief will progress from anticipatory grief through the immediate news of the death to the stages of acute grief and for some the complications of bereavement uh, can we move on <coughs> yes right and um, let's just first look at what is normal grief so that we know what not to pathologize right the next slide in normal grief this is what we see we see emotional waves of distress unavoidable crying preoccupation with thoughts of the deceased reduced concentration other somatic symptoms like restlessness numbness weight loss fatigue or behavioral symptoms like social withdrawal or seeking consolation <coughs> if this is what is happening immediately post death we just need to be a supportive presence let them know that we are available to help if they ever feel the need but sometimes active intervention is required when we see some abnormal patterns which differ from this one of them is anticipatory grief yeah next slide okay anticipatory grief precedes the death it results from the expectation of that event so just expecting that this is going to occur is what leads to a grief response before it happens okay and what are some of the common difficulties that can emerge in anticipatory grief impaired coping because family members might either deny the seriousness or they might withdraw they might not be involved 
in the process or they can show anger. That is what happens when they are undergoing anticipatory grief. Here, our role is to encourage them to express their feelings openly and to help them recognize that saying goodbye is a process. It's not a moment, it's a process. So there are going to be opportunities to celebrate the life of the patient, to express gratitude, and to take care of unfinished business on the way. And that is what they need to focus on, rather than focusing on what will happen after. Next is complicated grief. Okay. Next one. Yeah. In complicated grief, complicated grief typically represents a pathological outcome involving psychological, social, or physical morbidity. Prolonged grief, the difficulty accepting the loss and meaninglessness, even six months or more after the loss. That is what we typically mean by complicated grief. And this is associated with poorer physical and mental health outcomes, even increased suicidality in those who survive. <clears throat> this is when active intervention is required by a specialized professional. And in this, again, inhibited or delayed grief is an avoidant form of complicated grief, where uh, basically you see the person as being absolutely normal immediately following the death, but because that the grief is inhibited at that time, and it comes out as a delayed response much, much later when people, other people have already started moving on. That is what we mean by inhibited or delayed grief. And the second thing is disenfranchised grief. Again, uh, all, something that we call the hidden sorrow, the marginalized. Uh, basically, this is seen in people for whom there is less social permission to express uh, dimensions of their loss. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, homosexual partners. Or uh, in cases of extramarital relations, where uh, the person that uh, this patient was having an affair with, let us say, does not have the social sanction to express their grief actively. So these are the cases where we would see disenfranchised grief, which is again a kind of complicated grief. <clears throat> and otherwise, we would see complicated grief more uh, when it is when the death is untimely or when it is sudden or traumatic. Uh, and if there is a lack of support system in place, which can help them go through this, and there are previous vulnerabilities, right? So this is what we need to keep in mind when we are looking out for complicated grief reactions. <laughs> Lastly, we get to psychological issues. Uh, some of the most common ones which we all know, definitely anxiety, depression, body image issues, like including loss of attractiveness uh, or issues of self-esteem and self-worth, also related to issues of social role and identity. Uh, but uh, instead of looking at it individually, we can all we can put it all under the umbrella term of distress, psychological distress, right? Basically, an unpleasant emotional experience of a social or psychological nature, which is tied to and interferes with the ability to effectively cope with illness and illness-related treatment. Making a psychiatric diagnosis and rapidly identifying patients in need of help uh, becomes difficult in a palliative care setting for many reasons. One problem is that psychiatric symptomatology may be mimicked by the side effects of medication or the disease process itself. Move on to the next. <clears throat> okay, so an underdiagnosis and underidentification uh, of psychiatric disorders is highly, highly prevalent. Uh, we'll be sharing this uh, PT with you later. So uh, the, the link which is in the slide about difficulty in diagnosing due to somatic symptoms, is a, is a, it's a detailed video on this. You can definitely go and watch it. It's really, really helpful and will definitely help you in your clinical setup as well. <clears throat> when we say underdiagnosis and underidentification, why does that happen? Mainly because as professionals, we are unable to recognize. So being able to identify and assess is very important for all of us. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so here is a table that I've included. Again, you can refer it uh, whenever you have time uh, in detail. Basically, this table will tell you about 
the key components of the diagnosis of major depression, anxiety disorder, and adjustment disorder when you are specifically speaking of palliative care uh, patients, right? So that you'll also get to know uh, not just about symptoms and time codes, you'll also see what to rule out, the rule out considerations, which is very, very important so that we don't misdiagnose, right? Next one. Okay, in a drive to address this, in a drive to address uh, identification and assessment, specifically in the context of cancer care, the uh, NCC and UK, that is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, uh, promoted development of brief and rapid screening tools for distress, which could be administered by any professional, need not be a specialist. So uh, even uh, nurses or uh, other volunteers who are working for you can also, uh, they'll also be able to do this kind of rapid screening. Uh, and that is something that we can definitely start using. There are hospitals currently in India as well who use it as a part of their routine checkups with patients so that they don't miss out on any kind of psychological distress. Uh, and if you find something in this, then you can definitely ask a specialist to probe further. Right? Uh, depression frequently remains unrecognized and untreated because it's dismissed as normal reactions, even in the face of severe affective disturbance. We feel that considering that the patient is going through a life-threatening illness, this is normal, yeah? But sometimes it is not just a normal grief reaction, but it is something more than that. It is clinical depression. Uh, can I go to the next slide? Okay. Uh, and the most common diagnostic difficulty that arises in palliative care setting is, as I said, how to interpret the physical or somatic symptoms that the patients present in the context of a possible depression. Uh, and the challenge is to determine whether these symptoms are part of the depression syndrome or a direct biological result of advancing illness, especially uh, in cases like cancer. What we need to do here is to focus on the non-somatic symptoms especially the classifying ones. For example, uh, inability to access <coughs> past good memories is something that you will see in clinical depression. If it is not depression, then in spite of how sad the patient seems to be, they would be able to access past good memories. Or uh, things like, let us say, if it is grief, if it is not depression, you will see that the patient's self-image will not change and they will readily respond to comfort or care. They will value authentic connection and they will be able to enjoy pleasurable activities. Whereas if it is a clinical depression case, this is not going to happen. You will see changes in their self-image. You will see that they are not responding to comfort. They are not enjoying pleasurable activities that they used to earlier. And they are trying to withdraw socially. That is when you need to uh, be alert that this seems to be getting into clinical depression. And it's always better to be on the safe side, be suspicious and refer to a specialist as early as possible. Again, occasional thoughts of suicide are quite common, <coughs> but frequent persistent presence of these thoughts would indicate presence of psychiatric complications. Many a times when assessing risk and intent, uh, we just need to acknowledge their need for control over death. That is what we see most of the times. Uh, and also, uh, co -op, I mean, collaborate with your nurses. Nurses spend most time in direct patient contact. They, it enables them to observe behavior more closely and gives them an opportunity for patients to express any kind of distress if they want to. So nurses may not be able to identify specific disorders but they'll definitely be able to tell you if a patient is having significant psychological distress. And how can the doctor or nurse working in a palliative care unit establish that a patient is depressed or requires treatment, psychiatric treatment or further assessment? You can do preliminary screenings. You assess. Yes, there are various different uh, ways to do this. We have face scales, we have distress thermometers, uh, we have other scales which are, I mean, clinician use scales like the caregiver burnout scale or we have the BTI that is the back depression uh, inventory. <coughs> uh, basically, all of these, what do they try to do? They uh, basically try to gauge the emotional temperature of the person. 
in case of palliative care many a times patients might be unwilling or unable to discuss symptoms so what we might do so many a time very naturally we might just go to the care giver and ask them the same questions right if i have a let's say i have bdi with me and I, it has questions my patient is not ready to answer i'll go to the caregiver and i'll ask them this is a very problematic thing to do because research shows that asking caregivers is extremely reliable in a palliative care setup their ratings are closer to their own distress and colored by their experience and perception of the illness rather than how the patient is actually feeling again when you're using screening tools or scales not all can be used because not all are valid in the palliative care setting uh, here the ones that i've mentioned on the slide definitely yes you can use them uh, some of the effective ones useful ones are edinburgh depression scale so bdi and there is one called zoom self rating depression scale again okay, use scales with discretion as i said uh, it is i mean uh, very surprising but just asking are you depressed sounds unreal but studies show that it is one of the most reliable predictors of actual clinical depression so keep asking it is definitely helpful to assess at admission but otherwise also always keep an eye out for appearance of new symptoms just like you would do for physical symptoms uh, and all members of uh, the healthcare uh, team may observe subjectively report distress that they feel a psychological in nature things like fear or anger or are psychologically mediated like pain or breathlessness these may or may not meet the criteria of a discrete psychological disorder but we need to still report it because regardless of the etiology regardless of the diagnostic label it is ultimately palliative care is about the patient's subjective distress which we need to help with right and our work is not only to identify problems and distress but also to see and help patients see their current support systems which can help with their distress and their internal personal resources and coping strategies their strengths right okay next <coughs> next okay and here are some some final pointers about what our patients need what your patients need regardless of what the diagnosis is when we are talking about psychosocial aspects of care of a dying person or a person who is facing a life limiting illness it includes the need for understanding of symptoms and the nature of disease the process of dying of acceptance regardless of mood sociability and appearance unconditionally accepting the patient self esteem that is as i said you know promote autonomy involve them in decision making a feeling a need for safety and security need for belongingness feeling like they are not a burden but they are wanted a need for love and when i say love very importantly human touch affection through human touch is something that patients many a times crave for spirituality and hope when i say hope i do not mean a hope to live but a hope for an improvement in any aspect of their life or of their all of their living so in the provision of psychosocial care for people at the end of life each of these needs must be identified and addressed uh next okay lastly just a few do's and don'ts uh very very important though be honest be trustworthy don't make false promises give false reassurances or information to your patients just to make them feel better or just to avoid difficult discussions respect people's right to make their own decisions don't pressure them into doing anything or into telling you uh, their stories keep aside your own biases don't judge them for their actions or feelings make it clear to affected people that even if they refuse help now they can still access help in the future it's not that the door is closed right very important don't talk about yourself your personal issues your troubles when they are talking about theirs ensure confidentiality unless uh, the issue mentioned affects the safety of the individual or of others don't philosophize moralize preach impose your own perspectives onto them 
most importantly, provide information, clear information that they can understand. Right? Uh, next. Very, very important. Take care of your own stress levels because this is not an easy field to work in, definitely. Uh, and as you see, most of these needs uh, that we spoke of are not about you being able to provide technical therapeutic expertise, but about being a non-judgmental, compassionate presence who is witness to their suffering, who is giving them space to express their distress and who is accompanying them on their journey, trying to help add life to their days, not simply days to their life, right? Thank you. Any questions? I think we also have a, a case. I present. want to ask one question. Uh, yeah. Uh, see, in uh, uh, four cardinal principles of uh, palliative care, uh, right. fourth one is justice. Suppose right. uh, a family is there and there is a patient, but in that family, one of the person is uh, uh, gone to jail. So, and uh, how do you justify or give justice to the resources which are available to be given to that family? People who are having a criminal history. You mean patient who's having a criminal history? Uh, and, or if uh, one of the members of the family is in jail. Okay. And what kind of resources are you talking about? Like... Uh, in uh, definition of justice, it is uh, hmm. fair utilization of resources. Right, right. So when we say resources, we talk about resources in terms of what the patient needs, in terms of health-related resources, right? Yeah, so yeah. Not, yeah. So we cannot deny, we are anyways not going to deny treatment to the patient or those kinds of resources which are in our hands. We cannot, definitely cannot talk about other resources which are not related to our medical profession. I can also see some other questions. What are other psychological disorders apart from depression in which we might find a patient of family? Okay. Uh, depression is one of the the commonest ones, and that is why I stressed on it the most, and also because it is a little bit confusing to uh, differentiate between depression and other, uh, like normal grief related uh, uh, indications. Apart from that, you might see anxiety is again many different kinds of anxieties. So, uh, you might see people who are undergoing certain specific phobias, you might also see a generalized sort of anxiety where. Uh, and uh, things like panic disorder, et cetera, et cetera. So that is definitely something that you will see in, in palliative care. But again, anxiety more so in caregivers rather than patients, I would say. At least from my personal experience. And uh, specifically in cancer, uh, yes, body dysmorphia is something that we do see, especially when they are younger patients. Anyone else? I think we are uh, short of time also. Uh, we have a case discussion, right? Yeah. Thank you, Adhya Mukta, for such a great session on psychosocial concerns. We all loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we will move with the case presentation for today. So the case presenter is Dr. Ashwati Ravindran. I hope she is here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so you can start with today's presentation. Over to you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Ashwati. So my case is... Yeah, ma'am, next slide, please. Yeah. My case is a 42-year-old male who is diagnosed to have post-operative paraplegia. So the presenting complaints are he has complete weakness of both lower limbs and complete loss of sensation below the waist. There is both bowel and bladder incontinence. So this has been there for the past 10 years since he has underwent the surgery. Then recently he is having sleep disturbance. History of presenting illness. 
The patient developed a swelling at his lower back 10 years back, for which he underwent a surgery at a private hospital in Trichy. The details of the surgery was not available to the patient, but he hasn't taken any chemotherapy or any cancer-related drugs. And he has not been told that uh, it has something to do with the cancer. So most probably it is not carcinoma. That is like our, uh, uh, our perspective. Postoperatively, he developed weakness and loss of sensation in both lower limbs. He also developed bladder and bowel incompetence. Patient is on urinary catheter since then, which is regularly changed once in a month. For the last few weeks alone, he is having sleep disturbance. Past history. At the age of 30, the patient fell from a pole, which is at the height of 20 feet, and he had sustained injury to his lower back. Actually, the patient was working, uh, uh, doing the sound systems uh, for the temples and other festivities. So he had to tie that uh, loudspeaker at a height, at a very uh, long pole. So he had no experience in that. So he tried to climb and while doing that, he fell down. That was at age of 30 years. So what he did was he just took symptomatic native treatment uh, just to relieve the pain. After two years, he developed a swelling over his lower back, which gradually increased in size and caused very severe pain. So because the pain was unbearable, he uh, consulted at a private hospital and they suggested him a surgery for the swelling. So the details of the surgery uh, investigations which were done at that time were not available to the patient right now. Next slide, please. So uh, with respect to recent um, development, so he had a pressure sore six months back, which was at stage two during, the, during our palliative care visit. We used to visit him um, usually months in a month. And uh, during the pressure sore, or the, there are some symptoms, we used to visit him twice in a month. So at this time, when we uh, visited him for catheter change, it was at stage two. Then we treated him and it was healed completely later. Patient is on urinary catheter since the surgery for the last 10 years. It is regularly changed. But there is history of recurrent urinary tract infection in the last six months. The last infection was in uh, month of November for which he was admitted in a government hospital for five days as inpatient and received IV antibiotics. Next slide, please. Thank you. On examination, the patient is conscious and oriented, looks weak. There is paler present. He is afebrile. The pulse is 90 per minute. Blood pressure is 120 by 90 millimeter of mercury. Respiratory rate is 18 per minute. On systemic examination, the muscle tone upper limb is normal and lower limb has hypotonia. Muscle power in upper limb is 5 by 5, but in lower limb it is 0 by 5. Cardiovascular system, S1 and S2 hurt, no murmur. Respiratory system, bilateral air entry present, no added sounds. Perabdomen, soft. There is mild tenderness in the left iliac region. Treatment, currently he is undergoing physiotherapy daily. His wife is very supportive. She is doing this regularly. Then bladder catheterization, it is being done and the catheter is regularly changed. Tablet B complex, it is given to him uh, after the regular urinary tract infection. So he has been getting uh, multivitamin, multivitamin and uh, sometimes calcium, like it has been given alternatively. Next slide, please. Psychosocial aspects. The patient is unable to walk and do his daily activities. Even though he is having a wheelchair, he is not that comfortable to do everything in a wheelchair. He sometimes he doesn't want to do that also. Then he is not able to go for work and he needs help to go everywhere. That is a very sad part for him because at age of 30, he got this trauma at 32. From age of 32, he was bedridden. He is depressed about the disease and his inability to support his family, both physically and financially. His wife, uh, when they were married at that time, she was not working. After, after his uh, uh, surgery and he was not able to contribute to the family, she started during, during, the, during the tailoring and she runs family with that income. Uh, income is not that high. Uh, maximum comes around uh, 3,000 to 4,000 per month. And she also gets financial support from her parents. The wife's parents are also supporting them. 
Uh, now this patient has two kids, 13 year old girl child who is now studying in eighth standard, 10 year old boy who is studying in fifth standard, uh, who are both of them are studying in government school. The patient wants to provide them better quality of education, which he is not able to do with his financial condition. So his main concern is post-operative paraplegia and depression about not being able to go for work, his financial problem. Now, a recurrent UTI for the past six months, and he's having sleep disturbance for the last few weeks. So my summary is a 42-year-old male with complaints of complete paralysis of bilateral lower limb and loss of sensation, bowel and bladder incontinence after surgery for the last 10 years with recurrent UTI for the last six months and sleep disturbance for the last three months. So the discussion points will be to how to address his physical, psychosocial and financial problem. How can we provide the overall support system to the patient and his family? How to prefer, uh, prevent the recurrent urinary tract infections in this patient? And how to prevent the bed sores in the future? Yes, so I open this for discussion now. So I would request all of you to put down your comments in the comment box or else you can unmute and answer to the first question. We would take up the first question as of now, how to address his physical, psychosocial and financial problems. Since the topic is on psychosocial issues and as we have a faculty here, I would like to discuss more about the psychosocial part initially. So I want you all to put in the comments, whatever you have in mind and we can take uh, our faculty's opinion too on that. Anybody would love to unmute and answer, then also it's fine. So what are the things that come to your mind when you hear such a story? Everybody is very silent. A lot more to discuss on this case because uh, it might seem very simple, but uh, when you consider it as a total, when you think in terms of physical, emotional, uh, psychological, the spiritual, as well as the social part, then I think you will be able to get a lot of points based on whatever doctor uh, um, has posted in the PPT. Ma'am, I'd, uh, I'd like to add one thing. Okay. I think is, um sleep disturbance that has started for the last three months and that is uh, his uh, daughter she has attained menarche at that time so mm -hmm. one of the reason when he was opening us to uh, opening up to us is he was like um, so much worried that uh, she has become a big child now and i'm not able to do anything for my family so that that is one thing which uh, uh, which is affecting him more this time yeah so he didn't have any sleep disturbance for the past 10 years. His wife is taking very good care of him. She takes really very good care. Uh, it's not like not even one complaint. They are very, they are trying to make him happy, everything. But this, for the last three months, he is having so many psychosocial, uh, uh, what to say, burden with him. His, uh, that has affected his life. Uh, it's more complicated to say. Okay. The um, ma'am, would you, would you like to comment on yes. this? Yes, yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, firstly, <clears throat> if we look at this from the lens of what will be discussed until now, this is very clearly uh, a case of loss of social role that we see here, right? Uh, as a primary breadwinner for the family, uh, and the, most of his distress is coming from there, that he's not able to provide for them anymore. So if we look at it that way, one thing is we also need to, uh, you know, this is this is a very uh, culture, culture specific thing that since he is a male, he has to be, the way that he can be a good father is to provide good financial conditions for his children. That is what is uh, conditioned basically, that is what he has learned, uh, that is what he has seen in the society and that is what he believes in which is absolutely, I'm not saying that it's not true, but what we can do is we can see if we can open up other 
avenues for him and open up a discussion about how he can be a good father i mean what are the other ways that he can be a good father you know not just providing financially but what are the other ways that he can be there for his children and support them i also wanted to know um, dr ashwati what is his uh, educational qualification Uh, sorry, ma'am. Ma'am, he has studied only up to eighth standard, eighth and he standard. start. Yes, ma'am. He started working after that uh, with a nearby uh, person. So from that, uh, he didn't do any further studies. He was from at the age of the fourteen years, he was working there only, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. With the okay. counselors and all those things. Oh. Okay. But he was doing well. It seems when he got married, he was doing well. When his wife was pregnant at that time, that in uh, like that swelling developed, the surgery, everything mm -hmm. happened at that. Time. Okay. 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 Yeah. We have few comments in the chat. So it's like somebody has commented counseling. He is depressed Correct. and helpless. Occupational therapy for an opportunity to work despite disability. That's really good. And Absolutely. maybe guilty and uh, should be motivated to do work sitting on the wheelchair, uh, supporting personal. Uh, from the family and improve the financial stability and the patient can be motivated to work from home. Uh, maybe he has oh, become apprehensive and insecure for her daughter and uh -huh. uh, he needs proper counseling from a counselor so that he accepts his health condition. His family uh -huh. can be directed to an NGO for financial support. Regular home care visits for the patient and counseling sessions can be conducted frequently. So oh, these okay. many comments have come. That's so nice. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful suggestions, all of them. Uh, I also wanted to, uh, uh, you know, also uh, talk about one more thing. Um, uh, when you have mentioned that there has been there is recurrent UTI and sleeplessness, right? Both these things can be mediated by stress. So uh, definitely, if we could have. Uh, Certain interventions focusing on those things, on sleeplessness and on uh, over basically reducing stress, so that uh, if there are any mediating factors in UTI and in, um, insomnia, both will be. And as you said, you know, in sleeplessness, so it's very evident that uh, it is due to a, a particular stress. Yeah. So if you have a clinical psychologist, uh, you would definitely, I mean, ask them for help in these two areas specifically. So to sum it up, actually, whatever I have thought with regarding to this case is like I would like uh, distribute it into all these columns that is physical, emotional, social, as well as spiritual. So, for example, in the case of physical, this person already has weakness. He has a loss of sensation in the bilateral lower limbs and bubble and bladder incontinence for so long. He has developed a prior sore previously, which we had discussed in the previous session regarding wound management. And one of the questions that Dr. Rashwati has put in the discussion points is regarding prevention of bed sores. So uh, for prevention of bed sores, what do we do as we discussed in the previous session? Uh, for bed sores, usually we advise the person to use air bed. That is one thing because this patient is uh, supine for a lot of time. Then we would advise that he should use an air bed. We will uh, give skin care properly. You can advise Vaseline petroleum jelly or Biolin for local application twice a day that you can say. And also you can educate them regarding the second army position change if he is in supine position. And the third thing is, if he is using the wheelchair, as Dr. Ashwati mentioned that this patient uses wheelchair also, then you would say every 20 minutes once, then he has to do the position change. Might be one push-up after like 20 minutes when he is in the wheelchair. So all these things we would consider to prevent a pressure so because now he has a healed pressure so. Um, later, uh, since he is now uh, plegic, we would always uh, need to tell them regarding how to prevent a bed sore. During every visit, you have to tell this repeatedly to the patient as well as to the caregivers so that this is prevented. So one of the questions is, was that, and prevention of recurrent UTI as Mukta ma'am was saying, right? So sleeplessness uh, with UTI, he has been getting repeated urinary tract infections in the past six months. That might be one reason why he is sleepless. And also we don't know whether he is in pain. 
and also we should never forget that even emotional pain and depression can even lead to sleeplessness so we don't know what he is undergoing so obviously a good communication we should develop a rapport building talk to him regarding why he is sleepless when you ask whenever you uh, like talk to a patient and they say that this particular patient has sleeplessness or something then you should ask him why why didn't you sleep last night what made you feel so or how many hours did you sleep all these history will make us understand once you start asking then obviously they will be able to come out and tell you that this is the reason why i couldn't sleep yesterday night some people might say it was because of my physical pain some people would say it's because i was thinking the whole night about my children most probably this person as you said the daughter had recently attained menarche and all that so he might be thinking regarding her future regarding the kids future and all that regarding you know um education support he is not able to support the family fully uh, he was he might have been the primary breadwinner previously but as of now since he is plegic is not able to go back and also you could imagine the guilt that he would have because of this because he climbed a pole he fell down and after that he developed a swelling he was in native treatment for a few uh, years but he skipped that and then because of the pain he went Uh, for a surgery because of the pain and swelling which was intolerable he went for a surgery hoping that it would be fine once the surgery is over that's what we humans think right whenever we take a decision okay this is going to be right but when you get back and when he developed this uh, weakness bowel incontinence bladder incontinence he was not able to walk he became completely bedridden then you could think how guilty he would feel because of taking that decision that would also be in his mind and at the same time anger uh because uh, anger on the treating physician the treating team like what did they do to me why this happened to me many of the patients who come to us for example with chronic pain uh, for, uh they would have underwent just a hernia repair surgery and after 6 months they would develop inguinodynia where there is severe pain and they would uh, just come and tell us like why did i go for the surgery ma'am that's the reason why i have landed up in such a pain now and this is very terrible i'm not able to take this up and this inguinodynia is there for so long it becomes very chronic that for years it paralyzes them totally so even in this patient i could just think because for the past 10 years he has been completely bedridden he is not able to do anything so dependence on his family members is there many a times uh, people might come and go they might not feel he might actually feel that uh, he has lost his self esteem he is not able to do anything for the family as of now no work thinking about the children's future and fear of getting pressure sores and even more Uh, becoming even more worse in future because already he had a pressure sore he would feel like even when he got the pressure sore it might be his wife who had taken care of him right so if she is a tailor so he has to go for work so he might think because of this it's adding even more burden to her even now he is already like you know full time on bed and wheelchair all this he needs someone to support so socially when we think uh, from the other aspect uh, we would first uh like talk about his food shelter and you know the basic necessities we don't know whether he and his family is able to get getting it you know and also if they are not getting or what we do is like we assess the patient in total we do a detailed psychosocial assessment and then if we find that obviously this patient will be coming under a below poverty line is what i think reading the case history and all that so in kerala we have certain schemes that can actually support these people people who are uh, disabled will be uh, physically challenged will be able to get some pension so we can just check on them that whether they have got these or not otherwise we can facilitate them through a social worker so that they'll be able to go and get it and uh, then we have to think in terms of food we can just go and ask them whether they are like getting all the meals regularly are they able to afford for it many of the times they would say like no uh, because we need to spend for my child's future uh, child's education many a times when the father the primary breadwinner goes into stroke or something the children also stop going to school because they couldn't afford the medical expenditure in a country like india 
So all these things happen. So we have to take this also in mind and need to do a detailed assessment is what I feel. And also as ma'am said, occasional rehabilitation because uh, right now he can uh, sit in the wheelchair. So whatever we can do is like, uh, just uh, we can like help them in uh, making pens or whatever he can do. He can sit and do maybe for one hour at home. Uh, he would be able to make few pens or otherwise if you, could like you know um like arrange and give a small petty shop for him and he will be able to take uh, be able to take care of it then it yields some income and it motivates him also personally so all these aspects in total we have to think and spiritually obviously if you assess he might have this question in mind why i am like why have i got this why did I fall down? Why did I go for the surgery? Why God, uh, if he is like, you know, very religious, he might think why God has given me this. So all these questions will keep on running in his mind. And when you do a detailed assessment, I think we can manage this person totally. And you can actually uh, arrange a urologist consultation for him because he's getting recurrent UTIs as of now. You can take a urologist of him because... Um, when a person gets repeated infection and when person is on catheter for 10 years, obviously every time when I see a patient who's on catheter, they usually ask me, uh, ma'am, when will you remove this? That is the first question they might be asking us. But we might be sometimes in a position where we will not be able to remove it. So that also adds to a lot of stress. So sometimes we might need a specialist referral for that purpose and take an opinion, see whether that can be removed. And also take a physical medicine and rehabilitation consultation, PMR consultation to like improve his activities of daily living, involve him in regular physio and all that. As Dr. Atwati said, already the family is doing, the wife is supporting. But still, if you want to make him even more better, what I would suggest is like for patients like this, we um, take them for a short course of admission at our unit for about two weeks and then manage all these symptoms. We give caregiver education on how to manage these symptoms. That doesn't mean when the family comes here, you have to support them. Like For example, if she is a tailor, she might be coming and standing with him every day. She would be losing her job for that 15 days, right? So you need to support them financially also. Sometimes you need to take that step also. Otherwise, you might need to arrange a caregiver something we need to do to improve him. But I would say the best caregiver would be the wife. So obviously you can bring her to your unit, then admit uh, them for a few days, maybe a short course of admission, train them and then send them back home and repeatedly follow up on them via uh, home care visit. Anything else to be added? Dr. Priyanka, you want to ask something? Yeah, good evening, ma'am. I uh, know, ma'am, actually, I just wanted to add something what I actually uh, thought about the psychosocial issues that we were discussing about for this patient. So uh, apart from, like you rightly said, that we can provide, maybe uh, we can connect him to some NGOs that can help him in getting some vocational training, maybe. Because as we said, the patient is in his prime and he's a male, patient, male person, a sort of head of the family in his prime. So rather than just giving him some uh, financial help Apart from that, I feel if he actually is able to contribute, maybe however little, that will give him that sense of autonomy and contribution towards the family. Apart from that, I believe like, uh, I think he studied till 8th standard and his younger child is currently studying in 5th. So maybe he can contribute in helping the, little, the younger child in some studies or some homework so that he feels like he is contributing in some way and he his existence is actually mattering to the entire family and it's not just him being a burden on all of them. So that's what I felt. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Anybody else wants to comment something? Mukta ma'am, you want to add something? No, oh, I think I think you have summed it up very, very nicely and comprehensively. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other doubts? I think we can, uh, if not, we can close for today. Any doubts or anything you want to ask, you can just unmute and ask. All other aspects, I think we have discussed. Yeah, I see one message. So thank you. Before that, I get some other message. Like if the patient is able to sit with the support, he can be started on clean intermittent catheterization, which will reduce the chance of getting frequent UTI. Yeah, maybe considered. 
um it will also give him some psychological motivation yeah something like intermittent catheterization or quantum catheterization that we prefer here but since he's getting recurrent uti i wouldn't say as of now we would go directly to that we need to look into that in detail and then decide on um, going with intermittent catheterization but that's really a nice point and um, connecting to some ngos who can employ him in some small scale home industries and give him the sense of autonomy and mattresses and poster changing. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mukta, for joining us for the evening in spite of your health condition. Yeah. You didn't postpone the session and you were kind enough to join us for the evening. Thank you so much for that. And thank you all the participants for making the session interactive. Just gently reminding that um, please do leave your feedbacks as it is very important for our improvement. This is Sri Priya along with Ms. Mukta Dhawalikar and Dr. Harshwat Kohana signing off from the Tipsy Co-op. See you in the next session. Till then, everyone take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.